Yes, I thank my colleagues because the next item of business is a statement by Michael Matheson on Infrastructure Investment Plan and Capital Spending Review 2021-22 and 2025-26. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement, so there should be no interventions and interruptions. I call on Michael Matheson. Cabinet Secretary, please. Thank you, President Officer. I am publishing today the Infrastructure Investment Plan covering the next five financial years and setting out a long-term vision of infrastructure supporting an inclusive net-zero carbon economy in Scotland. It has been prepared and published alongside the Capital Spending Review, which has been led by the Cabinet Secretary for Finance. It is the first time that a new infrastructure and investment plan has coincided with a multi-year capital funding settlement, strengthening the strategic coherence and providing assurance that our capital investment programme is fully costed and affordable. Together, they deliver our national infrastructure mission commitment. This means over £33 billion of Scottish Government investment over the course of the next parliamentary term, supporting over 45,000 jobs and a fundamental element of our economic recovery from the economic harms caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. We are living through a time of huge uncertainty, and the economic outlook is very challenging. Such challenges require clear leadership and a vision for the future that provides stability and hope to businesses, communities and public services. The Infrastructure Investment Plan, the new multi-year capital plans and the investments that they will support aim to provide that clarity. Through these plans, we want to boost market, business and supply chain confidence in sectors across the Scottish economy and to encourage the necessary private sector investment. These plans also give public bodies certainty and the opportunity for medium-term planning. Last September, I stood in the Chamber to launch the first ever consultation on our approach to infrastructure, infrastructure investment. We sought views on a number of key aspects, such as our definition of infrastructure, the priority we place on maintaining existing assets, and how best to assess the full range of outcomes that infrastructure can deliver. I was delighted that we received almost 150 responses, and I would like to thank everyone who took the time to respond and to welcome the very positive feedback which we received during the course of the consultation exercise. Many highlighted the complexities that we face, and in particular welcomed the overwhelming support for our proposal to have the widest definition of infrastructure in the UK and many parts of the world by including natural infrastructure. With broad support across all of the proposals consulted on, I am pleased to now deliver a final infrastructure investment plan focused on delivering good outcomes for Scotland. It focuses in particular on the transition to a net zero emissions economy, driving inclusive economic growth and building resilience and sustainable places. The plan is based on a new investment hierarchy approach, as recommended by the Independent Infrastructure Commission for Scotland. This framework will enable us to realise the economic benefits of prioritising maintenance of existing assets over the creation of new assets, where appropriate to do so, while ensuring that we are reflective of local infrastructure needs. To complement this approach, the capital spending review will target a material uplift in capital maintenance investment, working towards doubling such annual investment over the next five years. This includes maintenance of the health estate with £1 billion of investment. This time last year, the Infrastructure Commission for Scotland made recommendations about the right future infrastructure priorities for an inclusive net-zero carbon economy in Scotland. 
In light of the COVID-19 and the UK departure from the European Union, the Commission's approach is even more needed than before. We want to build a Scotland that harnesses opportunity and is resilient to future challenges, driving innovation, creating good and green jobs, and supporting well-being. We must recognise the role that our infrastructure investment will have in ending Scotland's contribution to climate change. When we updated the Climate Change Plan in December, we highlighted the transformative action needed across all sectors of the economy and across society. But investment in publicly funded infrastructure has a critical role to play in supporting that transition. This plan confirms the £2 billion of additional low carbon investment to be made over the course of the next Parliament, including £120 million to support the transition to zero, and to, to zero emission buses, which we expect to lever in up to £1 billion of private sector investment. These infrastructure investments are supported by £100 million a £100 million Green Jobs Fund and our new Green Jobs Workforce Academy. The plans include nearly £1.6 billion to transform the way we heat our homes and buildings, as detailed in our forthcoming Draft Heat in Buildings strategy, which we estimate will support up to 24,000 jobs in Scotland. And in laying the groundwork for an inclusive, greener transport network, details of the transport investment priorities for the next few years were published yesterday in Phase 1 of the ongoing Second Strategic Transport Projects Review. The Infrastructure Investment Plan supports these priorities, with over £550 million to support active travel, including £50 million on active freeways, and over half a billion pounds to progress the decarbonisation of our railways. We will serve the, serve the, uh, this, this will serve the serve, uh, this, this will also uh, provide the opportunity from the COP26 summit later this year to make sure that we inspire uh, action right across Scotland and globally in helping to support a green recovery and to achieve net zero, as demonstrated by the approach Scotland is taking with its world-leading role in developing low-carbon technologies. While reducing emissions to net zero uh, is key, we are also preparing for climate change, which we are already locking in. With more extreme weather events and rising sea levels expected, as a nation, we must adapt to these changes. Ensuring our homes, businesses, transport, health and essential utilities are resilient to the risks caused by changing climate, especially flooding, is crucial. The draft plan sets out a package of measures to support climate adaptation and enhances our resilience, including £150 million of additional funding for flood risk management and £12 million for coastal change adaptation to help us adapt to the threat of sea level rises and to protect our assets. Today, I can announce that we will make £68 million available to support climate change adaptation and resilience in our trunk road network. Second officer, this year has brought unprecedented change to our daily lives. As we consider our path to recovery, we must not only simply go back. We not. We must not simply go back to the way that the way things were done previously. We must ensure our investment plan provides the best possible foundation for our economic recovery. We know we must invest in digital connectivity and digital inclusion to help businesses, workers, and service users exhilarate the uptake of digital services. In recognition of this, today I can announce £110 million of new investment in a digital public service programme to help support the transformation 
of key public services. Second officer, in summary, this plan now details over £26 billion of projects and programmes. Since September, new investments have been included across the three themes of the plan, including £480 million for housing, £110 million for digital, almost £500 million for transport, and £400 million dedicated to tackling climate change through the Low Carbon Fund, completing our commitment to investing an additional £2 billion over the next five years. Then, officer, infrastructure investment touches all of our lives and can provide huge opportunities for Scotland's people. The publication of the Infrastructure Investment Plan and the Capital Spending Review sends out a very clear message that the Scottish Government will do all that it can, working with partners to secure our recovery from COVID-19, harnessing new opportunities and to deliver a positive future for the whole of Scotland. And on that basis, I commend the plan to Parliament today. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. The Cabinet Secretary will now keep questions on his statement. I will attend to 20 minutes for that. Can I remind members, if you want to ask a question, please press R in the chat function. And I call, first of all, Graeme Simpson. Mr Simpson, please. Um, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of his statement? We welcome the publication of this plan, the broadening of what we mean by infrastructure, along with the doubling of investment in bridge and road maintenance are good. We are still in the midst of a global pandemic. People across Scotland are worried about the impact this is having on jobs and their communities. The capital spending does not feel adequate or ambitious enough to rebound and rebuild Scotland's economy from the deepest recession on record, showing this government is tired and out of transformative ideas. The Scottish Government's track record on delivering major infrastructure projects has been woeful, with unopened hospitals, overdue and over-budget ferries, and a supposed state-of-the-art bridge that keeps being closed due to problems with ice. Increased infrastructure investment is vital. We welcome it, but so is its actual delivery. So the Cabinet Secretary needs to say how he will ensure that these ple pledges mentioned in this plan will not be a repeat of previous fiascos. Yesterday, we saw the publication of the Strategic Transport Project Review 2 update. The document mentions a rollout of so-called active travel freeways, and I guess these will be similar to London's cycling superhighways. I saw no clear plan for delivery, though. Where will they be? When will they be delivered? What will the cost be? And who will fund it? And on the interesting-sounding Glasgow Metro and Edinburgh mass transit strategies, can the Cabinet Secretary tell us what will people see in the hinterlands of both cities that will be different to what is there now? And finally, it would be remiss of me not to ask about improvements to the East Kilbride to Glasgow line. People just want to know when the track will be dueled and electrified. So what's the answer to that? Thank you. Uh, it's a bit, bit of a long question there, Mr Simpson, but Cabinet Secretary. I'm saying also, I'll try to deal with some of the issues as quickly as possible. Um, uh, Mr Simpson will recognise that the Scottish Government has got a very strong record in investing in infrastructure right across Scotland, uh, from the borders right up to the Highlands and right through the central belt of Scotland. Uh, whether that be investing in new hospitals, schools, roads or digital infrastructure, this Government's record on investing in infrastructure is second to none and has demonstrated a level of ambition that goes way beyond anything that we have ever seen from a Conservative government at Westminster. The member also raises a challenge about he says it is not ambitious enough. I think that is a reflection of the fact that in Scotland, our priority is to make sure that infrastructure investment is prioritised on the basis of local needs, and how that can also help to achieve our net zero ambitions. But some of the investment that we are taking or would plan to take forward has been compromised. Compromised because his colleagues at Westminster have cut our capital budget by over 5%. The consequence of that is 
is that the level of investment that could be given to infrastructure has been cut and compromised by his colleagues at Westminster. On the specific points that he raises regarding STPR 2 and the publication of the Phase 1 report yesterday, the member may want to pay a little closer attention to the actual report, because if he does so, he will know that active travel highways will be developed in partnership with local communities in order to connect their towns and cities. And in relation to the proposal around the Glasgow Metro, the member may want to refer to the Connectivity Commission, which was published just over a year ago by Glasgow City Council, which demonstrates that the Glasgow Metro proposal goes way beyond the boundaries of Glasgow City Council itself. It is about helping to make sure that it improves transport connectivity across the Greater Glasgow area into areas such as Lanarkshire. I'm saying, officer, I'll finish in the final point in relation to electrification of the East Coast Bride Line and the drilling of the East Coast Bride Line. The member should pay closer attention to the work that's been taken forward within his own region, because that work has already started. The electrification programme on the East Coast Bride Line and the process for taking it forward started back in July last year, and the programme continues to roll forward. Thank you. I call on Smith to be followed by Stuart McMillan, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and thank you to the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of his statement. At a time increasing investment in our infrastructure will be more important than ever if we are to recover from the pandemic, drag Scotland out of the deepest recession on record, and deliver a just transition to a green economy. It is disappointing to see that there are planned cuts in capital spending in crucial areas such as rail and local government in the year ahead, and so few projects that appear to be shovel ready to kickstart the economy. And when it comes to delivering major infrastructure projects on time and on budget, we know the Scottish Government's track record has been woeful. Three quarters of the projects in the existing infrastructure plan agreed in 2015 have suffered delays of the equivalent of 64 years, and costs rose in nearly half of those projects, costing the taxpayer an extra billion pounds. So can the Cabinet Secretary tell us what specific lessons he's learned since the last plan? And what measures he's put in place to ensure we don't have repeats of the ferry fiasco, the sick kids hospital scandal, the super slow rollout of super fast broadband when it comes to delivering projects in this new plan? Cabinet Secretary. Mr. President, President this is a very ambitious plan to make sure that we can help to deliver economic growth, also help to support social development and community resilience, and at the same time to meet our net zero ambitions. Uh, the member will recognise that our capital investment programme into rail is at record levels in Scotland, demonstrating our ambition to make sure that we expand and that we decarbonise our rail network right across Scotland. And that reaches into every part of the country, including some of the proposals which were highlighted just yesterday in the course of the publication of STPR 2's Phase 1 report which will also see the decarbonisation of the Borders railway line um, in the years ahead. What I can say to the member is that one of the things that I do recognise that in taking forward major infrastructure projects is that challenges can be encountered for a variety of reasons, whether that be due to challenges in relation to the project itself due to weather-related issues or uh, problems with the uh, ground conditions or other complications which can come about through contractors going into administration. These can all have an impact on major infrastructure projects. But what I can assure the member is that we always make sure that we look at what lessons can be learned from major infrastructure investment projects. And I'm sure he will recognise uh, the very strong report that was issued when they considered how we had taken forward the Queen's Ferry Crossing, the biggest infrastructure project to date that has been delivered in Scotland which came in under budget and was actually highlighted as being a very good example of taking forward a major infrastructure project. So you can be assured that we always look to learn from major infrastructure projects and to ensure that those lessons are used for any future infrastructure projects. Thank you. Before I call Stuart McMillan, the usual mantra, I have 12 members wanting to ask questions, just over 12 minutes in hand. A shorter question, please. We'll get everybody in and see if I can ask for answers. Stuart McMillan, followed by Alexander Burnett. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide an update 
on the Scottish Government's latest engagement with the UK Government regarding its Union Connectivity Review, bearing in mind that uh, transport infrastructure is a devolved matter, and uh, it, does, it does look like it's actually another uh, power grab from the Tory UK Government. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, uh, Stuart Millon is correct. The, the Union Connectivity Review was nothing more than a power grab on the part of the UK Government, and a means by which they were seeking to try and undermine the devolved settlement in areas of devolved competence, such as transport, not just here in Scotland, but in Wales and in Northern Ireland. And they received a response from all three ministers responsible for these areas of policy across the Welsh, Northern Irish and Scottish Government opposing the approach that the UK Government were taking to this issue. Um, I'm always open to working with the UK Government on cross-border issues and where there is a mutual interest and a mutual benefit for us to work together, and we have a track record in doing so. However, priorities around transport investment in Scotland will be made through the STPR2 process, just like was set out in the Phase 1 report yesterday and the Phase 2 report, which will be published later this year. What we will do is we will continue to make the very significant level of investments that we are putting in right across the country to make sure that we have the type of transport infrastructure which is necessary for the years ahead. Alexander Burnett, followed by John McAlpine. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Now, last year, seven of the ten bridges that collapsed in the UK were in Aberdeenshire, who are still unable to fund a £5 million maintenance programme due to continued cuts to council budgets from this SNP government. Now, the Minister recognises that there is a massive backlog in capital maintenance, all of which has accrued under 14 years of SNP management, but fails to recognise his responsibility to Scotland goes beyond trunk roads. So is he going to continue to put the blame on underfunded councils and watch our roads and bridges fall apart? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, officer. It's always a bit rich listening to a Conservative member of the Scottish Parliament talking about the Scottish Government underfunding local government when we have had over a decade of austerity which has been opposed, imposed upon Scotland by repeated Conservative governments at Westminster. The member will also recognise that local roads are the responsibility of the local authority and for the local authority to take forward any maintenance or replacement programme which is necessary. They also may want to reflect on the fact that Scotland's capital budget that would actually help to support not just the Scottish Government, but also local authorities in investing in these types of capital projects has been cut, cut by his counterparts at Westminster by over 5%. The direct consequence of that is that there is less capital funding available both for the Scottish Government and for his colleagues within local government. So if the member is genuinely interested in making sure that local authorities have the capital funding necessary to invest in local infrastructure, he may want to start having a word with some of his colleagues at Westminster and to tell them to stop cutting our capital budget. Thank you, John McAlpine, followed by Claudia Beamish. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary how will Dumfries and Galloway benefit from the Scottish Government's infrastructure investment plan? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, uh, Dumfries and Galloway will benefit in a number of different ways, including through the uh, Borderlands deal, which will see the Scottish Government investing uh, some £85 million, which I hope to be able to sign off as a finalised deal with the Borderlands Councils very soon. Alongside that, as part of the £26 billion of investment, which has already been agreed to major projects within this investment plan, uh, both uh, Phase 1 and Phase 2 of the £2 billion Learning Estate Investment Programme includes uh, works at Dumfries High School. I have no doubt that that will benefit pupils and the community as a whole, and the member can be assured that we will continue to look at what other investment opportunities can be made in Dumfries and Galloway, including, uh, for example, we are considering a proposal uh, which would involve the redevelopment of the Stranra Marina, and we're also looking at the possible investment in areas such as a business park facility at Chapel Cross. These are all investments which I've got no doubt will benefit the whole of the Dumfries and Galloway community. Claudia Beamish, followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Commission recommended the inclusion of natural infrastructure 
uh, in the in the plan. And Scottish Environment Link calls for I quote strong support from Scotland's nature network central to a green recovery, creating a positive change to the economic and social activities of our communities. What reassurance can the Cabinet Secretary give today after really quite slow progress in these areas um, in the past? Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, did you catch all that? Um, I, I think I may have lost part of the question, President Officer, because I think Claudia Beamish has screen may have frozen at one point. Do you want... Uh, well, that I'll... Uh, however, uh, in general, the member will be aware that we have included natural infrastructure in our definition of infrastructure as part of this infrastructure investment plan, which will ensure that we can actually direct capital investment into areas of natural infrastructure. The member will be aware that we have set out uh, a range of plans to uh, look at investing in areas such as forestry and peatland restoration at record levels all of which are key parts of our natural infrastructure that will play an important part in helping us to achieve our net zero target. Uh, Kenneth Gibson, followed by John Finney. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, for safety reasons, the construction on new roundabouts and flyover at the junctions of A737 and B777 and A737 and B706 has been a priority for the communities of Beer Gateside and across the Gannett Valley for years now. Consultation has taken place and exhibitions held by Transport Scotland to confirm that made orders were laid on 9th of December with no challenge to them since. Will construction of this long-awaited project therefore begin on site during financial year 2021-22? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, following the successful resolution of objections that were received and the orders for the scheme that have been made, um, it, it became, uh, they became operative on the 9th of December last year, uh, which was a significant milestone in completing the statutory process in relation to the site that Mr. Uh, that, uh, uh, Mr. Gibson is referring to. What I can confirm to the member is that, on the basis of the allocation which we have received during the course of the budget process uh, for the forthcoming financial year, that progress will now be made in moving to the procurement phase uh, for construction of this particular scheme, and I would expect to see good progress, good progress be made with that in the months ahead. John Finney, followed by William Finney. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Madam Secretary, for early citing statement and welcome the £12 million for coastal change adaptation to deal with the threat of sea level rise and the £60 million to support climate adaptation and resilience in the Trunk Road Network. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that the majority of roads under threat from sea level rises are not trunk roads. And I notice comments about local need. I previously written the Cabinet Secretary about the South Road Causeway eh, from Bambetola to South Hewis, where in 2005, family of five were swept into the sea and sadly round. There was also issue with the 75-year-old Churchill Barrier in Orkney, Orkney and many other locations. Can the Cabinet Secretary, noting what he said about local government finance, but this is an infrastructure statement, so can the Cabinet Secretary please indicate what specific monies will be given to local authorities to counter what is acknowledged as a significant threat to their infrastructure rising sea levels? Mr Finney, that was not a short question in anyone's book, and I am going to not get through everybody, so let us move along. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, presiding officer, the capital spending commitments are set out within the budget that was published just last week for local authorities. And I know that the Cabinet Secretary for Finance continues to have engagement with local authorities on their annual capital spending uh, programmes. Uh, we will ensure that we continue to do everything we can to support local authorities in meeting some of the capital challenges which they face within local infrastructure. Willie Rennie, followed by John Mason. We must have urgency on tackling climate change. Your infrastructure projects are bedeviled by delays. And now the levelling of major transport projects, public transport projects, means delays by two years. The low carbon fund work on active freeways, segregated cycle routes, means delays by five years. How do these facts live up to the loft of this strategy? Cabinet Secretary, did you get that? It froze a bit. It, it froze a bit, but I think I got the, the gist of it. I, I'm sure that it, in relation to active travel, I'm sure Willie Rennie will recognise the record, le record levels of investment which we're making in active travel. 
uh, over £100 million a year, which is half a billion pounds over the course of the next five years, which gives security funding to take forward major active travel projects. In addition to that, the provision for the active uh, freeways is an additional measure to help to support connectivity between towns and cities through active travel. I'm now going to take forward planning work around that with our colleagues in local authorities and within the active travel sector to look at how we can design that programme to its maximum effect. But the member should be in absolutely no doubt the record levels of investment which we are making in active travel is resulting in the delivery of much more active travel infrastructure right across the country at a rapid rate. John Mason, followed by Bill Bowman. Thank you. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary mentioned a 5% cut in Westminster's capital funding, but I think the fin financial transaction money has been cut by a lot more than that. Will that also have an impact on the capital spending? Cabinet Secretary. Um, John Ray Mason raises an important point. Uh, not only has the uh, capital budget been uh, cut, but our financial transactions uh, for capital spending has also been cut by over 66%. Uh, this has come about as a direct result of the UK government uh, deciding to reduce uh, the level of financial transactions that are available for social housing provision. Uh, we have taken as much action as we can to try and help to protect our own social housing budget uh, and to minimise the impact this has had. And my colleague Kate Forbes is making representations to the Treasury on the scale of this cut within the course of one financial year. But the member highlights what is an important issue about the way in which the UK government are taking unilateral decisions that are having a, ma a significant impact on our capital spending budget within the course of a year, and also not providing the certainty in the years ahead. But we'll do everything we can to try and minimise the impacts of these cuts on the Scottish government's budget. Bill Bowman, and if I've got time, I'll call Polly McNeill. Mr Bowman. Thank you. The STPR process identified the merits of a Dundee relief road as far back as 2008, and it recently emerged that the city's air pollution is back to pre-pandemic levels. So, does the Cabinet Secretary have any specific plans to reduce commuter traffic, journey times and pollution in Dundee? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the member will be aware that the Dundee City Council have got very ambitious plans to introduce a low emission zone within the city over the course of the next couple of years, with a specific objective of helping to reduce uh, the, uh, the volume of traffic within the city and also to improve air quality within the city. We are providing financial support over the course of the coming financial year and in the years ahead to help to support the delivery of that programme. So I've got no doubt that the member will want to support the Dundee City Council in taking forward what is a very ambitious programme to help to ensure that we improve the quality of air within our major cities, including that of Dundee. Pauline McNeill. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. What is the game changer in making net zero in Greater Glasgow, which needs to overcome the weakness of its connectivity problems as travelling south to north requires terminating? at the central mainline. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that a commitment to Crossrail is surely the kind of game chamber that will lead to a serious modal shift across Greater Glasgow? Cabinet Secretary. Paul McNeill will be aware that the Connectivity Commission for Glasgow set out a range of measures that they believe should be taken forward to help to improve transport connectivity right across the Greater Glasgow area, including that of a metro system. The member will be aware that in publishing the STPR2 Phase 1 report yesterday, we gave a commitment to developing that proposal. We are now taking that forward with partners within Glasgow City Council and beyond in order to look at what that could be developed into in the years ahead, including uh, from uh, north to south in the city and also from east to west, and connecting into those areas beyond the city boundaries itself. This has got the potential to be a real game changer for Glasgow and the Greater Glasgow area, and we are determined to do everything we can to help to support that they realise that vision and that they are able to transform the way in which transport connectivity is provided right across the district and the area. And if you're very brief, Mr. Coffey, I can just squeeze you in. Thank you. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, in light of the other expected disruption to Scotland's exports to the European Union via the Channel routes? caused by the Tory Brexit shambles. Does the Scottish Government support and encourage new ferry services 
to emerge that might connect the ports in the west of Scotland directly to the European Union via Dublin Port? Cabinet Secretary, briefly, please. Uh, officer, we're always very supportive of looking at how we can uh, support and develop uh, direct connectivity from Scotland into other European destinations, including through uh, ferry services. However, in doing so, any service would have to operate on a commercial basis. We have had engagement with interested parties in the past, uh, and any commercial operator that is looking to establish a link between Scotland and other European destinations is uh, something that we would always be willing to discuss and to consider what support may be available to them in taking it forward. Thank you very much. And that concludes questions on the statement, and it is time to move on to the next item of business.